before getting in to my message, just to a reminder of what, what we were just doing. Uh, we're committed to the public reading of this book, God's Word. He has spoken, and He, if we believe, continues to speak to us. We want to read this out loud. And that, you know what? That's one of the patterns we see in the book of Acts, right? So we open this book up and we proclaim it and we read it. And so our call to worship before Ryan sings, we, he reads a scripture. Uh, before the message is preached, there is the scripture again. And then even our benediction, right, at the very end, provided that the thunderstorm doesn't come this time, you know, you're going to have it again. So just a reminder why we read this so much is because we're committed to hearing what God says. And I would even just say this. At the end of the day, I want you to hear, not from Sean Powers, but from the Lord. I want you to hear from what God has said. So that is my prelude to the message. Um, Again, just want to highlight for you the importance of Scripture. That's what we're committed to here at Redemption Hill Church. Let me briefly pray and then dive right in and let's see what God has for us from the rest of Acts 16. Father, we we thank you that you have spoken, and so we need to have humble and soft hearts to receive all that is that you have. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would reveal more of Christ to our hearts. We want to walk in a manner worthy of our Savior Jesus, and so Uh, We do that knowing that we are active in our faith, but we are also helped along by the Spirit. And so, come and have your way this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good. Since uh, becoming a Christian in my early 20s, uh, some of you may know this, I've traveled all around the world. I've had the good fortune of traveling to places like Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Zambia, Bolivia, uh, Romania, Dominican Republic, Afghanistan, just name a few places. And uh, I go with purpose, right? It's not like I'm getting on an airplane and I'm taking vacation. Uh, I've never done that. <laughs> uh, I go to serve. And some of the activities uh, from these trips include like putting on a VBS, right? A vacation Bible school, uh, feeding the hungry, digging wells to provide clean water, building schools, and, and of course, caring for orphans. And I think we all would agree that these activities are good and, are, and they're an act of like Christian charity. Especially in America where there is so much wealth and prosperity, we need to hold what we have loosely for those who are in need. And so we go and we offer and we care in practical ways. That's a good thing. Uh, when it comes for caring for the needs of the poor, the, I think the universal church is continuously in the game. The church steps up again and again. What happens when there's a natural disaster? What do we see? It's the church who's going and saying, I'm in. I'm going to help in that s- tsunami. I'm going to help with that d- disaster relief because of the hurricane. But what if I told you that none of these activities were the primary reason for traveling across the globe on an airplane and sometimes getting on, after the airplane getting into what looks like an automobile to a village that has no running water and electricity. What if I told you that these great things that we do are not the primary reason in which we go? What would you think if I told you there's a more significant reason for traveling to an impoverished town and digging a well to provide clean water? What if I told you that when, we, when I went to Bolivia and took the death road to the orphanage, like it's literally called the death road, that we were doing more than providing food? What if I told you the chief reason for taking that trip is to help Bolivians answer one question? One question. The entire chapter of Acts 16 highlights the one question that every person since the dawn of time has asked themselves. Now the question has been nuanced to some degree depending on your culture or uh, the dominant religion in a particular area. It's, it's, It's nuanced for sure. But it's a question humanity has wrestled with 
in part because innately we understand there's sin in ourselves and in the world and there's something beyond us, something transcendent. And so we ask really important questions. The question is raised for us in verse 30 of today's passage. It's this. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? It is this question that penetrates the mind and reaches the heart. It's the question that atheists ultimately deny, but even they need to ask the question in order to get to their denial. It is this question why a myriad of Christians since the time that we read about here in the book of Acts have given up everything to place themselves in a foreign country and foreign culture. They want to help others answer this question. It's the question, it's the answer to this question why, you know, I've, I've actually literally slept on a floor of cow dung that was hardened <laughs> in a remote village. Because we want to answer this question. What must a person do to be saved? Last week in verses 1 to 15, our world travelers, at least as they saw it from their perspective, had, had taken the gospel of Jesus Christ along with the answer to this question to the edge of Europe. As we know in the, in the book of Acts, the gospel is continuing to go out. It was a milestone when they got to Europe. We know Paul will eventually make his way to Rome, but for now he is blazing a new path in, in frontier missions. That's still happening today in the church. We're blazing new paths to reach people who do not know about Jesus. Praise God. Paul, he's in this great city, you might remember, called Philippi. The city of Philippi is filled with Roman tradition and a lot of money as well. In Philippi, Paul and his friend Silas seek out the Jewish community. We saw that last week. They find them by the river, outside of town, praying. Paul shares the gospel. And a woman named Lydia, she believes in the gospel. She, she, she hears Paul say that you need to have faith in Jesus in order to be saved, and she believes. Now, here's what I did not highlight last week, but I want, I want you to see how Luke describes Lydia's conversion here. It says in verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention what Paul was saying. Luke, the author of Acts, in my opinion, is a Calvinist through the book of Acts. While Paul did preach the gospel, it was the Lord working in Lydia to save Lydia. Lydia did not open her heart. Paul did not open her heart. But the Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, opened her heart to see the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a result of, of her conversion, of believing upon Jesus, the Lord would establish, like, First Church, First Baptist Church of Philippi, you know? Now, as we move forward... In Acts 16, we see once again how this gospel ministry, what Paul was preaching, once again we see this, it's an inviting persecution. Paul and Silas are not looking for a fight, but a fight finds them. In past weeks, we have seen how scenes change in the book of Acts rather quickly, but this time, not the case. Paul and his companions remain in Philippi for a much longer period of time, at least what is recorded here in Acts. It's like they got the extended stay hotel room, and they're going to park it. Why? The Lord has more for these missionaries in Philippi. Others must hear and respond to the gospel. And so they do ministry, and they preach, and they share. But they encounter a problem during their ministry. That's what we read today. Part of the problem is that they encountered prison. Some of the business leaders of the city did not appreciate their ministry, and Paul and Silas, they found themselves locked up. 
So, it's, it's a bit of the scene in which we read. Now, I want to kind of navigate the rest of this passage by looking at what was going on prior to prison, what was going on in prison, and what happened after they got out. So how did they get to prison in the first place? What's up with that? While proclaiming the gospel, Paul and Silas, they had a stolaway, right? Uh, this person had, it, said in, it says in the scriptures, a spirit of divination, which, which means she practiced the occult. It's dark, it's evil. Now, while it might seem she was affirming the gospel message, I don't actually don't think that's the case here. She was actually mocking the gospel. She was a pest. I mean, this went on for days, and they're preaching, and she's in the background kind of repeating everything Paul says. Now, I would not have been as patient with, with Paul, uh, as Paul was with her. I don't know what I would be able to do, like, just in a matter of a few minutes, if someone back there was like, hey, and just repeated everything I said, you know? Like, what do you do with that? <laughs> well, Paul, he eventually had something to say. She was deliberately distracting Paul, Silas, and their hearers. It says in verse 18, Paul says, Having become much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So a couple thoughts on this remarkable event. First, notice how Paul speaks to the Spirit and not to the slave girl. Jesus did something similar. It's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. He cast out demons from a man, sent the demons into a herd of pigs, and the pigs kind of go over the cliff. When we read about moments like this, we need to be reminded of, a, of the more significant spiritual battle that takes place in our world. There is a battle between good and evil. And they're at war. Think of it this way, perhaps. The demonic spirit that was in this girl did not want her to respond to the question, what must I do to be saved? The demonic spirit wanted to keep the girl enslaved. And so did her owners. But Paul saw through it. And in the name of Jesus Christ, and again, another familiar pattern in the book of Acts, in the name of the Lord Jesus, the Spirit left the girl. Some scholars uh, have speculated the girl was, was actually saved right there. We don't know for sure, but it's not an unreasonable suggestion. So all is well, right? Well, little did the girl know she was being used to turn a profit. When her divination power left, so did the money. And her owners were not happy. So they began to spout out lies. Their lies created a mob. The mob and the leaders of the city turned on Paul and Silas. We read between verses 20, 22 and 24, they were beaten with a rod, Paul and Silas, beaten with a rod and put into the inner prison which is probably a prison underneath the ground. Notice from the example of Paul and Silas what the Lord requires from Christians who proclaim the gospel. Faithfulness. You know, God has entrusted you, Christian, with the greatest news this world could ever know. But faithfulness to God sometimes has a temporal price. There are times when faithfulness to God opens up a door to persecution. Uh, this past Wednesday, I was on the phone. It was actually a Zoom call with a friend. He's a pastor in, in Philadelphia, urban Philadelphia. And when it comes to context, uh, we are in totally different worlds. As we were talking about the various circumstances in our, in our country, many circumstances which you all know what's going on, but we, we agreed, although we have very different ministry contexts, we agreed on a particular point. The church in America 
is going to be persecuted. In my opinion, persecution is coming very soon. Now, we were having that conversation, not like to stir each other up in fear. That wasn't the point at all. But we were trying to be honest and perhaps a bit prophetic, looking to the next five to ten years of pastoral ministry. And if we're right, we must prepare our respective churches for persecution. Now, while we might not be beating, beaten with rods like Paul and Silas, Persecution happens in different ways in the workplace. And there are social media clowns who come after you for standing on uh, God's word and, and believing in what it says in this book. You might be called narrow-minded because you believe there is only one way in which a person can be saved. The exclusivity of salvation through Jesus Christ is indeed offensive to many. And when this happens... How, are you, how will you respond? Even just a quick look at church history shows us this pattern. The Christian church continuously undergoes persecution. We might not be persecuted right now here in America, although I'd said it, I think it's coming. We have brothers and sisters in places all around the world who face death every single day because of what they believe. And so I think it's good for us to ask those same questions that they're asking themselves because they're faced with it all the time. When persecution comes, how will you react? How will you respond when you stand up for your faith in Jesus Christ? Now, it's almost jarring to read how Paul and Silas responded after being beaten with rods because they shared the gospel and saved a young girl's life from a demonic spirit. Here's what they did. When they got into prison, they prayed. And what else did they do? They started singing hymns. Let me just think about that. The rods being pressed against your back one moment, and then the next moment, you're raising your hands because you're like, I love you, God. I love you, God. They didn't complain. They didn't shift the blame. They did not murmur, gossip, or slander. You know, I've never been put into prison for committing a crime but I have to imagine a lot of unhappy people are in prison. But not these guys. Why? They rejoiced in their God and not in their circumstances. If anything, being put into prison merely shifted the location of their ministry. They're on the streets proclaiming Jesus one moment, now they're in prison proclaiming Jesus. They were like, hey, all these other prisoners are not going anywhere. So like, I can almost hear Paul saying, hey, Silas, let's just pray and give praise to Jesus, and they're all going to listen in. They showed lasting joy and peace in the face of persecution. The world may look at Paul and Silas and say they're crazy for how they reacted to the beating, right? But they're not crazy. They're not crazy because they refuse to be held captive by fear. Their hope is in God and God alone. Luke even adds in verse 25, he just makes it really clear, and it's not a throwaway statement. The other prisoners were listening in. They're right there, heard everything. As they prayed and sang, the other prisoners were hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's no different than when I'm preaching right now or when Ryan was leading us in worship and song, somebody kind of was listening in on the other side, be like, they keep talking about Jesus. What it means to be saved. 
This is like the, the first ever prison ministry <laughs> right here in Acts 16. Now there's another lesson for us here. Your circumstances do not need to zap the joy out of your relationship with God. Your circumstances, however hard they might be, are never wasted, ever. Here's the question. I want to make it as plain as possible. How would you respond if you were treated unjustly like Paul and Silas? Might be a tough question to answer, but if you can see the hand of your sovereign God in the circumstances, then you will be able to see the gospel opportunities that are right in front of you, even if you were in prison. Uh, Speaking of God's sovereignty, it's made plain once again in Acts. The earthquake that we read about was not an accident, verse 26. It was a giant earthquake. The quake brought down the prison walls, the doors were open, the shackles came off. Now all, all this might seem like fantasy land, but remember something I said last week? The book of Acts is one of the most historically accurate and reliable ancient documents. It's written with precision and detail. Further, there is no reason to suggest God who created the world and sustained the world can't bring a giant earthquake for his good purposes. You know, but the miracle of this release should not be overshadowed by what happens next. In some ways, uh, the Philippian jailer is the center of today's story. Everything kind of leads up to what happened in prison, and then we have a response after Paul and Silas get out. Uh, The snippet we receive about this man's life is remarkable. Here's what we know about this man that we read about, the Philippian jailer. We know from verse 33 that he was a family man. He did his job, and then he went home to his wife and kids. We also know that he was a Roman soldier. To be a Roman soldier is to have honor and a strong sense of duty. We also know he was in charge of the prison when the walls came crumbling down. It says in verse 27, the jailer was asleep when the chaos assumed. So when he woke up to see the prison doors opened, a rush of fear came over him. He did what any honorable Roman soldier would have done. Because of his perceived lapse in duty, the jailer grabbed his sword put it into his chest, I imagine in his heart. And just as he was beginning to bleed from the tip of the sword, he hears this, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Paul and Silas did not escape. As a matter of fact, Paul saw the providence of God at work. Paul recognizes that he, in part, was put into prison to minister to the jailer. Again, we can step back for a moment and learn something here. You do not need to be a super apostle to have the same kingdom perspective as Paul. Every moment, every situation... All your circumstances are gospel opportunities. Like, what are you doing this afternoon? Where are you going? Will you bump into anyone at the store, a restaurant, or a park? Perhaps there's a family member you will Zoom with later who does not know the Lord. All of these and more are opportunities for you to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. I think God is challenging me and all of you to see the possibilities, and then not waste the gospel opportunities. The Philippian jailer needs to know what it means to be saved. And Paul is there to help him think that through. And here it is at last. The most important question any person could ask. In verse 31, the jailer asks, What must I do to be saved? 
Now, the word save in the Bible is used in various ways. But I think the Philippian jailer is far less concerned about his circumstances at this point and is now thinking about the state of his soul. It's not unusual for a person on the brink of death to do an inventory of the soul. For those without hope in the gospel, faith and death has an intensifying effect on a person's assumptions, right? Like, is there somewhere I'm going after I die? What does the Philippian jailer need to do to have the joy and hope demonstrated by Paul and Silas while they were in jail? What kind of salvation or rescue changes a person so dramatically that the troubles of this world begin to fade and hope displaces the fear? Believe upon the Lord Jesus. That's it. Believe upon the Lord Jesus. That's Paul's answer. The great Paul who wrote the book of Romans, right? That's his answer. That's it. Believe upon the Lord Jesus. Notice, in one sense, the exclusivity of Paul's answer. The Philippian jailer could not save himself. His works, as we've seen already in the book of Acts, you can go to the book of Galatians, your works cannot save you. His, Romans, his Roman gods could not save him. Paul cannot save him. Paul is not the Philippian jailer's Messiah. There's only one road that leads to salvation, and it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Think about it. The jailer went from potentially going to straight to hell one moment and then the next moment becoming a child of the living God. It's remarkable. There's no gimmick. There are no ten steps to trying to figure out God. Simply believe in the Lord Jesus. In this verse, we see the the beautiful and straightforward gospel message and gospel response. And in a moment, the jailer went from approving the wounds that were placed upon the back of Paul and Silas to bringing in the water and the rag to bring them comfort because of their wounds on the back. You cannot explain that kind of transformation in a person's life and heart and thinking other than believing upon the Lord Jesus. One moment he's saying yes to the beatings. Get them. And the next moment he's saying, we, I want to help you heal. That is a radical transformation. I think the conversion of the Philippian jailer and the conversion of Lydia are paired together in Acts 16 to help us see the inward and outward working of God in a person's salvation. On the inside, we see it's God who opens up a person's heart. Like I said, Lydia didn't open up her own heart. It says very clearly, God opened her heart. On the outside, we know the importance of proclamation and response. Again, under the banner of the sovereignty of God, we see how human connectivity matters when it comes to seeing others drawn to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 10 makes so much sense when it says, How then will they call on him in who they've never believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, 
how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God the Holy Spirit uses Christians to proclaim the gospel, and God the Holy Spirit does the work to open the heart to His elect. (laughs) We see how it works so beautifully together in Acts 16. The sovereignty of God to save, but also what God is calling us to do to help others hear about Jesus Christ. Moving on in our story, they eventually get out of prison, right? Earthquake came, the Philippian jailer takes them home, feeds them. (laughs) By the way, after he was saved, the Philippian jailer is baptized, him and his entire household. And then in verses 35 to 40, we see a a bit of first century politicking taking place. (laughs) But the main point of it all is that the gospel mission continues to go forward. It cannot be stopped. To this day, the gospel mission continues to go forward, and it will not stop until Jesus returns. So up to this point in this message, I have have focused on our response to the persecution by placing our lives alongside of the experience of Paul and Silas. I've also tried to encourage you to be faithful in your gospel ministry, even in the face of persecution, however that could look. But I want to end by stepping back to help you see more clearly what God is doing. Let's take a snapshot of the bigger picture from Acts 16. It's clear from Acts 16 Lydia and the Philippian jailer had received the grace of the gospel. They were saved. I tend to think the formerly demonic slave girl was also saved. I believe there is purpose and place in her story between the story of Lydia and the Philippian jailer. Now, if you grant my presumption, then what we see in this chapter is a diverse first century church forming. Between the three of them, we see an economic and cultural differences but they are all united by one gospel. Lydia would have been a wealthy businesswoman from what she knew to be Asia. The Philippian jailer, a blue-collar Roman soldier, probably a retired Roman soldier at this point of his life who's in charge of the jail. And of course, the slave girl would have been like a gypsy roaming the streets of Philippi trying to make a buck. But all of them are brought together by Jesus. The great John Stott said it like this. It would be hard to imagine a more disparate group than the businesswoman, the slave girl in the gallow, the jailer. Racially, socially, and psychologically, they were worlds apart. Worlds apart. Yet all three were changed by the same gospel and welcomed into the same church. In my opinion, no other faith, no other religion, no other political ideology invites people from all kinds of backgrounds into the same place to worship the one true God. The gospel message is for all who will receive and believe. And as we see, those who receive and believe create a diverse and beautiful church. This is what it looks like as the kingdom of God continues to go forward. And we're going to see more of this as we go forward in the book of Acts. But we also see a picture of what life will be like in heaven. Let's pray.